Christopher Columbus by Benny Rhodes, Chapter 10, Searching for the Mainland. The new settlement in Hispaniola was named Isabella in honor of our queen. Now that it was underway and Diego and Hoyeda were there to build it, I felt it was time to continue looking for the mainland. I felt confused and disappointed about my discoveries. According to what I had read and the maps of the world that were available to us, I should have found China, Japan, and India. But so far, all I had discovered was many islands. These were all beautiful and interesting, but they were not what we had, had expected. I knew also that the king and, and queen would be unhappy with our mission. In the first place, they were expecting gold from the new lands, which so far we had not found. They were looking, too, for a profitable trade route to the lands of the Orient, and that we had not found. On April 24, 1494, I left Isabella with three ships. I used the Nina as my flagship and the two caravels, San Juan and Cordera, to haul supplies and to help with the exploration. We sailed west by north to the land of Colba, Cuba, where we had been before. I was not yet convinced this was an island. I believed at the time it was part of the mainland, and I wanted to explore it further. The natives of Colba received us in, friend received us in a friendly way and prepared for us dishes of fish and iguana. But the Indian interpreters we had brought with us from Hispaniola were unable to understand the language of these strange Indians. One day, while we were sailing along the coast of Colba, we saw ahead of us majestic mountains which seemed to rise up out of the sea. We ran down to this new island which I thought was the most beautiful one I had discovered. The island was Jamaica, and it was heavily populated with Indians. The native canoes on Jamaica were the largest we had seen. Some of them were at least 96 feet long. They were hewn from the giant mahogany trees from the forests of Jamaica. We sailed back to Colba soon, however, because I wanted so badly to find the mainland. We threaded our ships in and out of the many caves and coves of the coastline, moving westward on the south side of Colba. Everywhere there were strange animals and creatures we had not seen before. Fernando de Luna, one of the men on the Nina, first spotted the flamingo birds with their bright colors and long legs which looked like sticks. Then we discovered, discovered a new method of fishing which amazed our men beyond measure. The natives used a tame fish called the remora, sucking fish, to catch other fish. They attached a line to the tails of these fish and allowed them to swim alongside their boats. The remora fish would swim ahead and attach itself to a larger fish or a turtle. The natives would then haul them in. Truly a remarkable way to catch fish. For almost five months we sailed in and out of the islands. We returned to Jamaica and discovered a new island called Puerto Rico. But two things happened which caused us to turn back. First, I collapsed aboard the Nina from complete exhaustion. The long months of constant work, kedging the ships in and out of harbors, and directing them through the shallow waters had completely exhausted me. Secondly, the ships themselves were in need of repairs. The eighty men on the three ships were cheered by the news that we were returning to Isabella. Even the small comforts of that place will be better than this, remarked one of the sailors. He was really homesick for Spain. Reluctantly, I gave the orders to turn back. I still believed that we had spotted the mainland, but I was not absolutely sure. Where were the cities Marco Polo had talked about, and the houses with roofs made of gold? All we had seen were shabby Indian villages. They had no houses, only tents, and the natives, although friendly, were far from being civilized. I could not explain the mystery of all of this. We sailed around the island of Jamaica once more on our way home. 
This time one of the Indian chiefs, together with his wife and two beautiful daughters, came out to the ship in a boat and talked with us in sign language. The chief wanted me to take him and his family back to Spain. I declined to do this, but promised to visit them again when we returned. On September 29, our little fleet sailed into the river bed at Isabella. We had been gone five months, and it was good to be home again. When I stepped on land, a small party of men from the settlement was waiting. I thought I saw a familiar face in the crowd, but I wasn't sure until he stepped up close to me. Bartholomew, I cried, how in the world did you get here? I missed your boat by one day, Brother Chris, he said. But when I talked to the queen about it, she decided to send three more caravels with supplies for the settlement. I sailed with them. So here I am in the new world you have discovered. Then you have been here for some time, I said. Yes, replied Bartholomew. I have been here for three months waiting for your return. Diego was happy to see me too. He had had a great difficulty difficulties with the settlement after I left, but things have been better since Bartholomew had arrived. Tell me about the progress of the settlement, I said to Diego after a while. There isn't much to tell about its progress, he replied sadly, but I have much to tell you. I looked around the settlement. I could see that not much had been done. The buildings were only half completed. Everything was scattered about. The sacks of seed we brought from Spain were still rotting on the ground. We will tell you all about it, Chris, Bartholomew interrupted. But first you must go to bed. The men tell me that you have been very sick at sea. You do not look well at all. I knew Bartholomew was right. Even as I stood there, I became dizzy. And I was so weak, my legs could hardly bear me up. The pains of my arthritis were hurting me too. I returned to my cabin on the Nina, which was the most comfortable place I could find, and went to bed. For days, I was unable to even walk. My meals were prepared and brought to me in the cabin. Gradually, I began to regain my strength. Diego talked to me about the problems at Isabella. I learned that Hoyeda and others had given him much trouble in my absence. He left immediately after you did, reported Diego. He refused to help with the settlement, all he could think about was finding the gold and mistreating the Indians. Did he find any gold, I asked. I knew the king and queen were expecting lots of gold from the new settlement. He found some, reported Diego. That is the only good news we have had since you left. It was Bartholomew who told me about the disgruntled settlers who had returned to Spain. It was a group headed by the soldier named Marguerite. He said, they were not happy with the way things were going here, so they took some ships and sailed back to Spain. Father Buell was in that group too, reported Diego. Father Buell, I asked. What was he unhappy about? He did not like my administration, Diego said sadly. He told me he would report all the bad things he had seen here to the king and queen. Well, perhaps it is best he is gone, I said. To tell you the truth, I never did really understand him. I didn't either, said Diego, but I am afraid he will cause us much trouble with the king and queen. Shortly after I returned to Isabella, a fleet of four vessels arrived from Spain with fresh provisions for the colony. The fleet was commanded by Antonio de Torres. He personally delivered to me a letter from the king and queen. I searched the letter for any sign of displeasure that might have resulted from the reports of the disgruntled colonists who had returned to Spain, but there was none. In fact, the sovereign thanks me for the good work I had done and for my enterprise, which for the most part has come true, just as if you had seen it before you spoke about it. The letter also spoke of a new treaty which the king and queen had signed with Portugal. They wanted my opinion on the treaty and wondered if I could return to Spain and discuss it with them. The letter stated, however, that if I could not return, I could send my brother or someone else 
in authority to a, to express my views to them. I knew when I read the letter that I should return to Spain, but the illness which had kept me in bed for almost five months was still with me. I feared the voyage. I sent Diego back to Spain with my report. He was to tell the king and queen that I would return as soon as I was able. Meanwhile, work in the settlement began to improve. Gradually, my strength and health returned, and I busied myself with the details of administration. Bartholomew was a great help to me. I had appointed him governor of the island. He was a strong and capable leader who could handle the men well. Soon crops were planted, and we had fresh vegetables daily. Buildings were erected, including the first church in the New World. I remember the joy I experienced on the first Sunday that we worshipped in, church, in the church. It was a joyous occasion, because the Indians who had been converted worshipped with us. I had at least seen some results of my role as Christ-bearer in, in the conversions of these heathens. There would be many more conversions in the New World, I was sure, as more lands were discovered and settled and more missionaries came to tell the natives about Jesus. In the summer of 1495, the little settlement, settlement at Isabella was thriving. More settlers had arrived from Spain. Gold was being brought in from the mountains. The spirit of the people was good. It seemed that all of us were determined to make a go of it in the new world. Then disaster struck a wind with a force I had never seen before either on land or sea struck the island of Hispanola. The natives called it a hurricane. The wind uprooted giant trees and dashed three of our ships to pieces. Violent waves tore away trees from the, from the land. The island was completely devastated. We were thankful God had spared our lives. We had lost all our ships but one, the Nina. It would take us months to rebuild the settlement and get things back to normal again. I immediately ordered the men to build another ship because I knew I would have to sail to Spain soon for help. The first ship built in the New World was a caravel which I named the Santa Cruz. While we were building the ship, a new fleet arrived from Spain, bringing more supplies and more colonists. But they, but they also brought bad news. The reports of Marguerite and Father Buell had finally reached the king and queen, and they were very unhappy about the situation in the colony. The king and queen had sent Juan Diego Diego, to the islands to investigate our affairs. To make it worse, they had given him the authority to go over my head and speak directly to the people. I must return home. At once, I said to Bartholomew, somehow I will get to the bottom of this. What do you wish me to do? asked Bartholomew, who was always anxious to help. You will stay here and govern the colony and rebuild the settlement, I said. We had already decided to build the new settlement in another location. We wanted to be away from the marshy lands of the riverbed where there was no protection at all from the hurricanes. I will stay, said my faithful brother. And with God's help, I will build a new settlement. I've been thinking about that, I said. Let's name the new settlement San Domingo in honor of our father. It was March 10, 1496, before I was finally able to sail for Spain. We sailed in two small ships, the Nina and the Santa Cruz. On our way, we revisited Guadalupe, where we stopped for fresh water, Soon afterwards, we were on our way home. When we sailed into the harbor of Cadiz, I found my old friend, Peralonzo Nino. He was preparing to sail to the colony with more provisions and supplies. How are things in the new world? Peralonzo asked. I told Peralonzo about the hurricane, the sickness, and the devastation of the island. I also told him about the new settlement that even then was being built by my brother Bartholomew and the colonists. I was surprised that he did not decide to stay in Spain, but he sailed away to the mysterious lands I had found in the sea. The king and queen wrote me a letter inviting me to their court, which was now located in Burgos, 
all the way to the north across Spain. I could hardly wait to get there because I wanted to see my sons, Diego and Ferdinand, who were both serving as pages for Don Juan. I reported to the king and queen. In spite of the reports I had received, they were very gracious to me. They received the gifts of gold nuggets, which I presented to them with pleasure. I spent several days with them discussing the new colony and the other explorations I wanted to make in the new world. I will need at least eight ships, I told the queen one day in a private conversation. She spoke to me honestly and frankly. My husband, the king, will not be very favorable to that proposal now, she said. He has been very disturbed by the fact that your discoveries have cost us a great deal of money. But it will all be repaid some day, your highness, I assured her. The enterprise will make Spain the richest nation in the world. Perhaps that is so, she replied. I certainly hope so. But meanwhile, we must go slowly in our request for a new voyage. I am sure that the king will come around, but it will take some time. Whatever you think, your highness, I said, I am at your service. And I still have faith in you, Don Columbus, said the queen, and I want you to know that. The words of the queen sustained me for almost two years while I patiently waited for another fleet and another change. Meanwhile, I spent some busy days with my family. We had to catch up on all the things we had missed doing together.